Let's look at the details of system calls. The system calls constitute the programming interface for the uh, system services provided by the operating system. They are typically developed using a high-level programming language, and the typical choice for that would be C or C++, because these are uh, high-level languages, so it's easy to program using these languages. Uh, but also, the code you generate using these languages would be very effective, uh, sorry, very efficient, uh, lightweight, but you can do even low-level details. That's why what you need when you're developing uh, system services. Uh, the application programs access the system services either uh, through an application programming interface, an API, or uh, through direct system calls. In general, uh, the preference is uh, using the API. That would be uh, typically your uh, programming language libraries, for example. For example, in C, uh, you use the standard uh, library, the uh, libc library, for example, for I.O. operations, for most basic I.O. operations. But it is also possible that you could directly make a system call, but that would be more tedious and error-prone. That's why we go through the API. The API hides all that detail from the programmer, uh, and it's easier to use, and it does all uh, error checks, whatever. So it's uh, much better to use that API. And that's what we are going to talk about uh, in the following slides. If we look at these APIs, for each operating system, there is a different API. In Windows, uh, it's the Win32 API. Uh, in the case of POSIX-based systems, like all Unix and Lin uh, Linux variants, and also Mac OS X, which is actually, as we discussed earlier, a, a BSD variant. In all of these uh, systems, uh, what we call the POSIX-based systems, we have the POSIX API. And uh, there's the Java API for uh, Java Virtual Machine, the JVM. You should note that the system call names uh, we're discussing here in the following slides are very generic names. So in uh, specific systems, the names could be slightly different, but the basic ideas are preserved. So, in a uh, basic uh, system call, for example, if you want to do a copy of one file from one location to the other, what you do is you first get the uh, name of the uh, file that is to be copied. You get the name and location uh, of the destination where it will be copied. Then you try to open the file, well, that might be successful or not. If opening the file fails, then you cannot copy the file at all. So you just give an error message and abort. But if it's successful, then you create the output file. Again, uh, when you try to create the output file, you may fail because such a file exists. So now it depends on whether you're allowed to overwrite an existing file or not. Assume that we are not allowed to uh, overwrite. In that case, that's a failure. Or, for example, the directory does not exist. So if there is no directory with that name, you can't create a file in the non-existent directory. So again, in this case, you will abort. But if these uh, two uh, succeeded, then you start reading from the input file, writing to the output file. Read, write, read, write. You repeat this in a loop until the final read operation reaches the end of uh, the input file and uh, that read operation fails, but not with an error, just saying that it's the end of the file. So you have comp uh, successfully copied the file. Now you should close the output file. Typically you also close the input file in order not to leave any open file handles. And since you successfully uh, copied the file, you inform the user uh, by writing a completion, uh, proper completion message, and you've reached the end of uh, the operation, so you terminate normally, not uh, by aborting. So its standard API looks something like this. Uh, this is an example. Uh, now, uh, we're talking about the uh, Unix standard header file, so you include uh, that header file, remember, 
in that you will find actually the API for the system call. This is not the system call itself. This is the API for the system call. And this actually, uh, remember, this is the header file. This, this is what you will find in the header file. The real implementation of the library functions, remember, are in the binary library, not in the header file. In the header file, just remember that you will just find the signature of the uh, functions. So you will find in the uh, unistd.h header file only this line, which defines the interface, the API. So if you are to call the read uh, function, you should provide a file descriptor, which is of type integer. You should provide the address of a buffer. So uh, at that address, you could have anything. That's why that address is a void pointer. And the number of bytes to be read. So it means the file descriptor points to a file which has been opened earlier by using the open uh, system call. As long as we have an opened uh, file pointed to by this file descriptor, it will read this many bytes from that file into the buffer area, typically an array string, uh, whatever, uh, into this place. And it will also return size t, which is typically of type integer, typically unsigned integer, which is the number of bytes that have been read. Now, you would expect that value, the return value, to be equal to the variable, uh, the parameter count here. Normally it is, but it is possible that, especially for the last read operation uh, by the end of the file, you could, for example, try to read 100 bytes, but actually there are only 30 more bytes left because we have reached the end of the file. So in that case, it would return 30. That's why when you're calling the read function, you should always check for the return value because it's possible that you try to read 100 bytes, but you read only 30 bytes. So you should not uh, continue after 30 bytes. So you should be careful with that. Anyways, this is just an example uh, API for the uh, read system call. Once again, this is not the system call itself. This is the API for the system call. This is what you will find in the C library. So when you're writing C, C++ uh, programs, you would call this library function and it would take the uh, arguments here and using these arguments, it will first process the arguments and see if everything is prepared, uh, is passed in the arguments properly. If everything is fine, then it will make a system call for you. Okay, and now we're going to discuss what happens, how you uh, make the system call and what happens when you make that system call. So the uh, system call is typically referring to a number. That's the call number. Okay, for each type of uh, system call, there's a different number. So this is just an in uh, index into actually an array of system call pointers. It's just a vector there again. Uh, so the uh, system call interface maintains a table or a vector indexed according to these system call numbers. And from that number, it will find the pointer to the function that implements that system call and it will jump there and execute uh, that uh, intended uh, system call, which means executing the corresponding uh, function. Uh, the caller, which is typically you as the programmer, needs to know uh, nothing about the system call. You don't need to know how that system call is implemented. All you need to know is the uh, function signature we, uh, we have seen in the previous slide. So you need to know that you should be passing a file descriptor, a pointer to the place where it will be uh, read, and the number of bytes to be read. And you should also know that this uh, API function will return you the number of bytes read. Okay? You don't need to know how that uh, 
read system call is implemented by the operating system. That's why we need uh, the API. So you just need to obey the API and most details of the operating system are typically hidden by the API. Uh, and these are actually all done in the runtime support library, which is just a compilation of useful uh, functions that make use of these system calls. So a system call uh, works like this. Your program is typically working in what we call the user mode. Remember the CPU, you will remember this discussion from, our, uh, from the previous chapter. The CPU is working either in the user mode or the kernel mode. The user mode is actually a safe mode. Many uh, operations that might cause problems and uh, mostly security problems cannot be uh, executed in the user mode. In other words, you cannot do many things in the user mode as the user, as a user application. All you can do is, from the user application, you call these library functions, like open, read, write, whatever. The library function will first analyze the arguments and check if there, uh, whether there are any problems with the arguments or not. If not, it will call, make the system call for you in the appropriate manner. It will put the arguments in the correct places, as we'll uh, discuss in the following slides, and then just poke the correct system call. That call to the system uh, call is uh, executed in the kernel mode. So the library function, while in the user mode, makes a request for a system call. And when you make a request for a system call, the operating system switches to what's called the kernel mode and ex uh, finds the corresponding system call. Remember, we have the call ID, which is an integer value, finds the uh, value at that index. This is a pointer to actually uh, the open system call. It's just a, uh, the pointer to the function that implements the system call. It will execute that system call and return from the system call. What it returns to is the library function you used, like the read library function in libc. It will return to that and that will prepare the return value for the uh, function and it will return to your user application. And the rest depends on what you want to do with that. Uh, note that this is, uh, this is, uh, this one is how you do, for example, when you're programming in C. It is possible for the user application to bypass the library uh, functions and directly make the system calls. That's also possible as long as you know how the system call works, where it expects its parameters. Instead of asking the uh, library function to do it for you, you can prepare it properly and then you can make the uh, system call. That's also a valid operation. But that requires that you really have a good notion of how the system calls work, you know the specific system calls, what they expect, and prepare your parameters accordingly. If not, you will encounter problems. Okay. Typically, that's what we do, for example, when we are programming in assembly language. In assembly, most of the time, we call the, uh, we make the system calls directly in our programs. But, you know, uh, regular programmers, they do not use uh, a low-level uh, language like assembly, but they work in higher-level languages. So if you make use of these system calls, it, it becomes much easier to program. So when you're uh, passing the parameters for the system call, uh, you, okay, you must provide the ID of the system call, but that's not enough. You should also provide some more information. Uh, you should provide the exact type and size of the information uh, 
And that depends on which operating system you're using and also which system call we're talking about. In general, there are three uh, ways of passing the parameters. Uh, one and the simplest one would be you pass the parameters in the registers. You put parameter one in, say, re register R1, the other one register R2, R3, whatever. But in some cases and often, you will need more parameters than you can fit in the registers. So this is the simple approach, but in most systems, it's not being used anymore. One, the second approach is you put the parameters, not in the registers because we may not have enough registers, but instead you put them in a table or a block in the memory and then give the starting address of the uh, of that table and also tell uh, typically how many uh, items you have there. And you pass that with the uh, system call ID uh, to the operating system and the uh, operating system will retrieve its parameters from there. This is the approach taken by Linux and Solaris. Uh, Solaris is remember the uh, new name of the Sonos operating system not used much anymore. And uh, another approach is you can put the parameters not in a table but you can push them onto the stack of the program. And uh, the operating system will pop them out of the stack uh, and operate accordingly. The block and the stack, the second and the third methods, do not limit the number and also the length of the parameters that can be passed uh, to the uh, system call since we are not using the registers uh, anymore for storing the uh, parameters. So uh, this is showing the case of passing uh, via the table. That's the second approach. So uh, you have some parameters for your system call. So you put them somewhere uh, in memory in a table. Let's say it's uh, at address X. So you put this address in a register, which is a specific register that's used in system calls, which stores the address of the table. So system call knows that it is in this register and you give the number of the system call. Here in this case, it's system call number 13. So the operating system will go to the table of uh, system calls and find the one with number 13. It will find the code for the system call there, system call uh, number 13 there. It will execute the instructions there and in the very beginning of uh, that code, it will go to this register, learn the value x here, go to the address x, take the parameters from there, and then use them in the implementation.